So to sum it up at this point of the presentation, anti-instrumental brethren within Churches of Christ hold that the New Testament does not authorize congregational singing along with instrumental accompaniment, that the New Testament is silent in regards to this matter, and that such silence is prohibitive. Only singing itself is directed. Only singing then is authorized. Adding instrumental accompaniment is a sin. On the other hand, there are those within Churches of Christ who have rejected anti-instrumentalism. These brethren insist that what we find throughout the Old Testament and New Testament is that instruments in worship are directed, encouraged, and portrayed in a positive manner. To apply the expanded Church of Christ version of the regulative principle, such a portrayal can be taken as an inference of the freedom for churches to include instruments in worship. Paul exhorted Christians to sing psalms, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, and yet he never warned them to avoid doing what the lyrics of numerous psalms direct and encourage, that is to praise God with singing along with the playing of instruments. And again, in the New Testament text itself, we do encounter texts that portray in a beautiful and affirming way musical instruments in worship, Revelation 5, 15. In fact, while the Old Testament and New Testament clearly list sins that we are to avoid, singing praises to God along with an instrument is not one of them. Furthermore, in regards to Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16, believers can and do sing praises with thanksgiving in their hearts, whether they are singing along with an instrument or singing a cappella. This happens every week throughout thousands of congregations of Christ's followers. Within these contexts, Instrumental music does not replace singing. The instrumental music accompanies the singing. As for church history, yes, there were a few centuries during which some of the early church fathers opposed instruments in worship. Yet it appears that the reason was not exegetical. It was pastoral and cultural. In their times, instruments had been long associated with pagan worship. As centuries passed, we can imagine that paganism was marginalized as a toxic influence by the church. The risk of instrumental music triggering a Christian to revert back to paganism was gone. Over the course of generations, we see that musical instruments were finally introduced into Christian worship in the West. There is another consideration. Perhaps it was normative for early Christian worship gatherings to feature a cappella singing and chanting, especially given what may appear to have been the tradition and influence of the synagogues in which so many first century churches were established. And when persecution started, there was probably a necessity to worship in a discreet way that did not draw the wrong kind of attention. Nevertheless, we still cannot say with any absolute certainty that there were never any occasions when a believer who was a musician may have been inspired by reading one of many psalms to bring an instrument to a worship service. It could have happened, and it could have happened without any resistance or condemnation from the others. 
We just don't know. Brethren who reject anti-instrumental dogma insist that both the Old Testament and New Testament positively portray the use of musical instruments in worship. Therefore, we have the liberty to use instruments. At the onset of this presentation, it was set forth that a growing number of churches of Christ no longer find anti-instrumental doctrine to be compelling. Among these are those that continue a strictly a cappella tradition. These churches may be regarded as being non-instrumental rather than anti-instrumental. There are also a number who continue the a cappella tradition while at the same time offer a weekly instrumental service. Now one might ask, if these churches of Christ no longer believe that there is anything wrong with instruments in worship, why do they continue an a cappella tradition? Well, here are at least some reasons why the a cappella worship experience is a tradition that continues to be observed. A cappella connects. For many of those raised within the churches of Christ, a cappella worship can connect us with precious memories from our formative years. Even if we grew up as fans of what are now classic rock bands and went to laser lit decibel blasting concerts, the a cappella worship experience is still an important part of the soundtrack of our youth. The effect of being a choir in the pews, singing songs from a hymnal, feels like home. Like a large number of those in the Stone Campbell movement, I was raised within an a cappella tradition. I can look back fondly across the decades to the time when my church family was at both the ascending and summit phases of its congregational life cycle. Our fellowship was made up of many families with children still at home. We held Bible classes from school age to middle age and beyond. We had a youth group of teens and young tweens that would gather for pool, pong, pizza, and prayer over at Dan and Jody Barney's. We conducted an annual VBS program. Adult groups from our congregation would attend annual lectureships and workshops, gather for in-home small groups, and go on fishing trips way up north. There were the gospel meetings, the ladies' days, potlucks, picnics in our beautiful city park, holiday gatherings, card games, baseball games across Beaver Valley Road from where the Kings used to live, and some moonlight bowling on a Saturday night dominated by people like Redmond King and Mary Gardner. Bible studies were being held that sometimes resulted in the baptisms of new members. Through it all, there was the congregational singing from a hymnal full of timeless songs of faith, hope, praise, and exhortation. Beautiful and uplifting singing in four-part harmonies led by talented and effective song leaders such as Ned Riffle, Redmond King, and Clyde Hubbard. We were not there to be entertained. We gathered as a church to be instructed from Scripture, to pray, to proclaim the Lord's death in the bread and cup of the Lord's table, to celebrate the good news of the Lord's resurrection, to encourage each other with our ministry of presence, to be reminded of what is most important in our mere mortal moments on this planet, 
to look forward to the Lord's return and to be blessed with a profound sense of purpose, hope, grace, truth, and a reassuring connection with our Creator, especially because we could still struggle at times to avoid saying and doing things that we later came to be ashamed of and to deeply regret. Purpose, hope, grace, truth, and connection with our Creator, and all of this in a cappella. A cappella is fail proof. It is a simple, organic, and stress free, low production approach with minimal moving parts. No PA system is really required. No one worries about the drummer, the pianist, or even a lone worship leader with a guitar failing to show. Of course, it helps for the song leader to have enough talent to stay on pitch and tempo to keep the lively hymns lively and the slower hymns from dying. A song leader who can prevent the embarrassing and discouraging scene of congregational singing that sounds as bad as dying cats in a hailstorm. Thank you, Anne, for that cute analogy. A cappella is pain free. In a non instrumental service, no one ever complains about the praise band playing way too loud. Those who suffer from tinnitus are spared the pain of excessive decibels. Of course, many churches led by a praise team are good about keeping the band's volume to a comfortable range. And yet, I and Many others have been at services in which the praise band was too loud. In an a cappella worship service, ear plugs are never required. A cappella is ancient. Indeed, it is apparent that for the first few centuries of the church, the usual approach to singing songs of praise in a gathering of the church was without instruments. When some experience a cappella worship, they may have a sense of participating in a tradition that is ancient and authentic. This can seem soothing, transcendent, and even serving as an expression of defiance to some aspects of current culture and times. Almost as if a cappella worship is an act of subversion against the radical secularism and neo-paganism we find ourselves facing today. Almost as if a cappella worship seems to be an expression of faith and hope in God that is defiantly indifferent to being hip, trendy, flashy, or cool. Many of those whose worship tradition has been non-instrumental are people who can still love to go to live music events, whether it is country, classic, rock, heavy metal, jazz, rhythm and blues, or some other genre. And yet, within the context of worshiping God, they are content to join together in a meaningful and ancient a cappella tradition of the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. A cappella is appealing. That is, when there is a sizable congregation of good singers who know the songs being led, the a cappella worship experience can be moving and appealing. This can be the case for those whose regular experience is a cappella as well as for a number of outsiders. I recall a man who was a member of a Presbyterian church for whom his wife served as the organist. About once a month, he would visit a nearby Church of Christ to experience the a cappella singing of hundreds of believers. While he found the organ-led worship at his own church to be meaningful, 
There was something about the huge a cappella choir in the pews that he found to be extraordinarily moving and inspiring. But what about the non-instrumental churches that are small, declining, aging, and cannot offer the inspiring and moving experience of being a vast choir of singers with hymnals in the pews. Well, regrettably, these declining churches may indeed struggle to reverse their decline. They may struggle in the West to be an attractional church. And yet not every believer or seeker requires that their worship experience features a full praise team that can lead the gathering in the contemporary songs heard on Christian radio. There are those for whom a simple a cappella approach will be a more meaningful experience for church. And yet for many, if not most, a worship experience that inspires and connects with them will involve a praise band leading the songs they all know from Christian radio. When someone from this broad category of believer attends a church that fails to inspire and connect with them in the worship, they will probably not return. No matter how friendly the members are, no matter how solid and biblical the teaching might be, they will likely seek out another church that as well is friendly, offers well-presented biblical teaching, and provides a worship experience that they are accustomed to singing songs that they actually know and find to be meaningful to their faith and walk in Christ. Yes, of course, there are ways in which an a cappella approach to worship can be meaningful, effective, appealing, and beneficial. However, here in North America, and in some other regions around the globe, congregational singing led by a pianist, organist, a guitarist, or a full praise band has been the norm for decades. For many, an a cappella service singing old hymns that they do not know and do not connect with could seem strange and uninspiring it will not likely be a meaningful and encouraging experience. For so many today, the old gospel hymns are unfamiliar. For so many today, their hymnal is Christian radio. Live music has been a powerful part of their life experiences, especially when the rock pop type of music they grew up with on secular radio and at secular concerts has been, well, redeemed and repurposed with lyrics that celebrate the gospel of the risen Jesus. Of course, many of these same folks value biblical teaching. They want to celebrate salvation from sin and death. They realize that they need to live out their Christian faith throughout the days of their lives. They understand how important and helpful it is to be a regular part of Christian fellowship. The new believers can understand how meaningful it is to have been buried and raised with Christ from the waters of baptism. They can understand how precious it is to partake in the bread and cup of the Lord's table and to engage in good works. And yet, old a cappella hymns do not connect. 
This is one of the reasons why a number of churches of Christ have developed additional worship services at their buildings that feature contemporary Christian music led by praise teams. Of course, they maintain the ancient tradition of the a cappella singing of classic hymns that they have found to be so meaningful. And yet, they understand that many, if not most people in their areas that need to be reached for the gospel or to be growing in their faith will probably not connect with unfamiliar hymns sung a cappella. These churches of Christ do indeed understand that there are believers who may be looking for a new church home, fellow believers who know that they have an abiding need for encouraging and equipping fellowship and teaching. It is expected that many of these fellow believers will not find the a cappella singing of old songs to be meaningful. So both and Churches of Christ have developed additional services featuring newer songs led by musicians because they want to reach more people for the Lord. They want to be able to encourage more fellow believers in their walk of Christian faith. They understand that if they want to effectively serve as an encouraging, equipping, attracting, sustaining, shaping, and teaching fellowship for other fellow believers, if they want to grow and effectively carry out the Lord's great commission, they will need to adapt in ways that enable them to connect with more and more people. 